Our second scripture today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until, just, until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it, and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory, I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I've been thinking about heroes a lot the past week. I, and I thought maybe I'd put this on, but I, I'll just hold it up again so you can all see that. <laughs> there are three players on the Steelers who have uh, been called by the pundits in the sports world now the Killer Bees. Ben Roethlisberger, Le'Veon Bell, and Antonio Brown. They are the best triplet in football these days, the best quarterback, running back, and receiver team in, in, in the league. And if they play well, common wisdom says they can beat anybody, and indeed will beat anybody if they play well. <laughs> And if they don't, they're playing right now, by the way. I'm having a really hard time not looking at my phone. <laughs> I haven't. It's being taped. I'm going to be excited, whatever happens. If they don't play well, they'll be out of the playoffs. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. They are heroes. Now, Pittsburgh is a football town, and Steelers, I tell people, are religion in Pittsburgh, and indeed they are. And if you went to Pittsburgh today and flew into the airport, I would bet you that at least 50% of the people in the Pittsburgh airport would have on a Pittsburgh jersey. If you went to the grocery store, people would have on their Pittsburgh, men and women, they have the largest female fan base of any team in the United States. Everybody would have on their, their Steelers jerseys. And I would wager that the majority of them would have those three players' names and numbers on them. Because they are killer bees. They are heroes. And if they win today and next week and another time after that, they will really be heroes. <laughs> And the expectations on them are really, really high. We do that in a lot of areas of life. We do it in politics. We have a current president who ran on a, a or a current uh, president-elect, who ran on a platform saying he would make America great again. And indeed, he was the only one who could do it and was elected by enough people who believed that was the case. We watch the, the letters to the editor in the news press, and we see that come there again and again and again. He's a hero to some folk. Of course, it happens in every stripe of politics. Those of us who voted for Obama 
some eight years ago, remember that slogan then for hope and change. And indeed, those there were many folk who believed that only Obama could bring about that hope and change. Then for this last election, perhaps the biggest hero of all was Bernie Sanders. And he had a crowd of true believers who really thought Bernie Sanders was the savior who would lead us forward into this coming golden age. And no one else could do it. And indeed, if we had only been smarter and had put him up to be the Democratic nominee, he would now be the president-elect doing a task only he could do. Heroes can be good. Heroes motivate people. They cause communities to coalesce. There was a group of people around Bernie Sanders that had never come together before. There was a group of people around Donald Trump that had never come together before. There were people who got involved in the political process who had never done that before. That was because they were heroes to those folk. Now, most of the time, heroes are heroes for a good reason. They tend to be really talented people. They tend to be people who have capabilities beyond that of most of us. And sometimes they accomplish amazing things, heroic things things that change the world. But of course, the problem comes for a hero when we expect too much from them, when we expect more from the hero than you actually can get from one person. Regardless of what we heard in political promises, the president-elect cannot fix all of the issues we face on his own, nor is he the only leader who can move us forward. Just not true. Bernie fans believed that he was the savior, but Bernie wasn't the answer to all of our problems. And had he been president, we would still face all of the same problems, and we would still struggle to fix them. Obama, regardless of how you feel about his presidency, you have to admit that all of the hope and change we hoped for didn't. Now, if we get back to the killer bees, the really important stuff, the stealers. <laughs> they can't do it alone, regardless of the fact that they are three incredibly talented men, and there are three of them. But they still need a, an offensive line <clears throat> that moves with power and precision. They need a stout defense that stops the run. The last time they played Miami, who they're playing today, they're running, the Miami running back up 204 yards, I think, against them. They can't let that happen or they lose. They have to have special teams who give them good starting positions and keep the other team from moving the ball. Every player on the team has to do his part. In this case, they're obviously all keys. And if one of them doesn't do their part, things are going to look ugly really fast. Marquise Pouncey's the center for the Steelers. He's an amazing center. If he decided, you know what, I'm not going to do my job. Let's see what happens to Ben Roethlisberger if I just sit down on the grass and look at the flowers. <laughs> it would get ugly real fast. The killer bees can't do much on their own. They need the rest of the team. Now, we get heroes in religious circles as well. I hear stories of previous pastors sometimes. And, and sometimes those previous pastors take on mythical proportions. <laughs> and and it, it happens in every church. You all know that, that the church that I started at was founded in 1688, and we had some, some pastors from that church that really were mythical. Elias Keach, the stories about him were astounding. He didn't walk on water, but everything else he did. Everything else he did. 
And we often expect pastors to accomplish everything. They come in with, with this mantle of heroship on them. And indeed, many pastors kind of accept that. But you know, the first question that every pulpit committee asks when they're interviewing a new pastor is, what will you do to bring in young families? And you is bolded with three underlines under it. What will you do? Oh no, not us. You're the pastor, it's your job. But as I was thinking about heroes, I wasn't thinking about pastors. I was thinking about Jesus. And, and, and I know from the very start, you're probably going, wait a second, what do you mean? When we talk about Jesus, it is different. Because if we are Christians, we do believe Jesus is our Savior. We don't have to, to lift him up and say, oh, he's, a, he's the Savior of the world. We, we actually believe that to be true. We do believe that to be true. But just like in sports and just like in politics, the reality is that Jesus can't accomplish all that much all by himself. I, I couldn't help but remember the, the joke about the gardener. And, and there was this lovely garden, and every day on her walk, this pastor walked by, and she admired this gorgeous garden, how carefully constructed it was, how each of the flowers were in the right place, and all of the colors just, oh, it was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. And one day, the pastor was walking by, and the gardener was there working, and, and she said, what a lovely garden you and God have made. Well, the gardener had been bent over, and his back hurt, and his fingers were dirty, and he probably got stuck on a few thorns from one of the rose bushes, and he was feeling not nice. Mm -hmm. And he looked up at the pastor, and he said, yeah. You should have seen it when God was taking care of it alone. <laughs> Today's scripture passage raises this question, I think, in an important way. It starts off with this character. This is my servant. And, and I asked in Bible study, who is the servant? And in good Christian theological tradition, everybody said, oh, it's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And it fits, doesn't it? When, when we read that passage and we think about the person of Jesus, it fits. He's the one who nurtures and cares for the bruised reeds, who brings dim wicks to full flame, who establishes justice and stands with those who are on the margins. This is Jesus who heals the sick and brings sight to the blind and brings those who are imprisoned by sin to full life. This, is, it sounds like Jesus. And then we talked about it a bit. And I said, you know, I don't think that when Isaiah spoke those words, he was concerned for a second about some Messiah who would come centuries later. He was looking at his world and his setting, and the likelihood is that I would bet Isaiah was talking about Cyrus of Persia. And indeed, if we read on a few chapters, in just a few chapters later, this same Isaiah calls Cyrus of Persia God's Messiah, God's anointed one. Wait a second. That's not right. And then I asked, who do you think, if we went to B'nai B'rith this week and talked to the rabbi, who do you think the rabbi would say this is? And some folks said, oh, I'll bet he'd say it's a Messiah that hasn't come yet. I said, well, I don't think so. I'll bet if we went and talked to Rabbi Cohen, he would say, no, it's a metaphor. And the servant is supposed to be Israel, the Jewish people, who are supposed to establish a blessed community that lives the way God wants all of us to live. 
and builds this kingdom of God and shows that to the entire world as a model for how all of us should live. I think that's what Rabbi Cohen would say if we asked him. I'm pretty sure. And indeed, if we talk to some more progressive Christian theologians, they might also read this passage as being a metaphor. And they too would talk about it referring not to an individual, but to the blessed community, to the church with a capital C that's supposed to be establishing God's kingdom on earth. The same one we prayed for a few moments ago in the Lord's Prayer. And you could make a good argument for all of those different interpretations. You could argue convincingly that the passage refers to Cyrus of Persia. You could argue convincingly that it refers to the Jewish community. You could argue convincingly that it's referring to the person of Jesus. You could argue convincingly that it refers to you and I. Now, a wise interpreter, and isn't that what we're all trying to become? A wise interpreter would say, yep, to all of the above. Now, as I was struggling with the passage this week, the piece that I was most concerned about is I think the easiest problem for us as Christians to have when we read this passage. And that is to identify it, the servant, solely as Jesus. Because when we do that, that does allow us to sit back and watch, waiting for Jesus to do whatever it is that Jesus is going to do. And when that happens, we all know from the gardener that the garden gets pretty sloppy. Again, we imagine Marquise Pouncey deciding not to block that linebacker who's coming across the line with blood in his eyes. And he might say that. You know what? Why am I going to put my body in front of this crazy man who's going to rip my limbs off if he can, when I'm not one of the killer bees? Nobody even knows who I am. Probably half of you here have never heard that name, right? Marquise Pouncey? Unless you're a Steelers fan, you don't care. But if he doesn't do his job, things fall apart. It takes more than just the killer bees. If we put the entire task just in the hero's hands, it's all too easy to become those Sunday fans who sit there wearing their Troy Palomalu jerseys, watching the game and yelling and shouting, but not really having any skin in the game. If we allow that to happen in this truly important question about how we live as people of faith. If we put the future of the world just in Jesus' hands, then we would be just like Marquise Pouncey sitting on his butt deciding not to block his man. And things wouldn't get better. If, on the other hand, we see ourselves as the servant, if it is referring to the blessed community, to the whole people of God together, called with the responsibility to make the world a better place, then, then we do our job. Then we do our job. Then we minister to those people we see out there. And, and we know folk who are bruised reeds, don't we? We know folk who are overcome by addictions. And regardless of how they battle that demon, they just can't get free. We, we know folk who have been hurt by the people who are supposed to love them and supposed to care for them. People who in not 
doing the job they were supposed to do ended up causing someone to lose a sense of self, to lose a sense of purpose, to lose a sense of value. We know some folk who were bruised reeds who, because of the color of their skin, the language they speak in their homes, the religion they practice or don't practice, the gender of the person they love, the fact that they don't feel like they fit into binary categories of male and female that all of us have come to expect, most of us have come to expect, the fact that some of them are here to provide for their family, but they don't have the right documentation that lets them get here legally. And in the midst of all of that, they are terrified every single day that because of those factors, they will become targets. Targets of the masses? Or worse than that, targets of powers and principalities, of governments and agencies who have the possibility to turn their lives upside down and inside out without a second thought. We know folk who are dimly burning wicks. Folk who live on the edge. And just the smallest push would send them into the precipice. It's easy here. The finances of living in this place are so tight for so many of us. It doesn't take much for us to end up living in our car. And you, you don't have to be out of work to be there. <coughs> it's, it's easy to get pushed off the edge. Some of us know folk who are dimly burning wicks who have been cast aside by society, and society has turned its back on them, and they feel as if it is all they can do to make it through the day. Some of us are dimly burning wicks, or no dimly burning wicks, who are depleted by illnesses that just take and take and take, and it feels like there's nothing left. Some of, some of us know dimly burning wicks who burn dimly because they look in the mirror and all they see are the things they have lost. They remember when they were young and strong and vital, when their mind was sharp and they didn't have to stop and think, what's that word again? When they actually could fantasize about running a marathon, even though they never wanted to. But they could. And then they look in the mirror, dimly burning, and they see a face there, and they wonder, who is that person? That's not me. Who am I now? And Isaiah's word to the bruised reeds, to the dimly burning wicks, is that God has not abandoned you. God has sent a servant to salve those bruises, to nurture those frames, to show the world what the blessed community is supposed to look like. And the wise interpreter reads all of that and says, yep, and that servant is us. It's us. It's us. Now, here's the problem. Sometimes, maybe all the time, we feel like bruised reeds. Sometimes, maybe all the time, our wicks burn but dimly. Shouldn't that disqualify us? How can you be a hero when you can't take care of yourself? How can you be the one who cares for someone else when you look in the mirror and you see one who is burning way too dimly? How can you be the hero when it's all you can do to hang on to the edge of the precipice and keep from falling in? And the paradox is that God chooses just 
folk like that to be the servant. The scriptures speak multiple places of the foolish confounding the wise, of the weak overcoming the strong, of the babe able to see that which the mature adult cannot. And in Jesus, we see that all personified. One who is meek and powerless becomes the one who overthrows the powers of Rome and even the very power of death. One who is despised and rejected, beaten and murdered becomes the one who brings healing for us all. In Henri Nouwen's book, The Wounded Healer, he tells us in capsule that Jesus heals us precisely because he is wounded and that we can bring healing to others precisely because we are wounded also. That God has chosen not to extinguish our flames, but to nurture them. Not to throw us into the flames when we are bruised and bent and broken, but instead to bring us healing. And then it is through ones exactly like you and me, <coughs> that God chooses to be revealed again. Isaiah says, God is sending a servant. And in that servant, those who are on the margins, those who are struggling, those who wonder whether they'll make it to the next day, will see the very presence and love and grace It's not a small task. It's not an easy task. But it is the task that God has given to us. Because the wise interpreter reads this passage and sees in it not only Jesus, but also the gathered community of Jesus. 